Hello, and welcome to the SMU Video Archive Series. In this series, we interview members of the SMU community who can provide insight into the history of SMU, especially from the perspective of their time at the university. I'm Bill Dorosik, Director of CMIT, and today we have with us Travis Jordan, founding and longtime director of Media Services and CMIT. Welcome, Travis. Thanks for being here. Oh, I'm happy to be here. Yeah. Let's begin today by uh, talking about your initial days and coming to SMU and uh, where you were, who you worked for, and transitioned into some other questions. Well, I came to SMU in 1965 at the invitation of the dean, of dean Joe Quillian, theology mm -hmm. school, to be uh, on the staff of the Bridwell Library. And uh, about the third year I was there, I went back to library school and decided I wanted to uh, get my credentials in the process turned out I wanted to be a teacher instead, so I got a degree in American Literature and, and, came, to S and, and came back to SMU in 1968 to teach in the University College program. And, and was the man, uh, uh, Nature of Man course, or was that the? That was uh, in the, uh, inter that was, this was the time when uh, the University College was uh, on a three-year liberal studies program okay. and uh, every entering student had to participate in a course called The Nature of Man, yes, mm -hmm. which was uh, teaching them uh, how to think, uh, how to get into the college environment, how to uh, um, lose some of the conformity that was, uh, we don't have that problem today, it seems like in our students, mm -hmm. but students that are coming to SMU in 1968 were really uh, programmed by their uh, education system. Mm -hmm. and so. We had some interesting things going through, through that course. And in addition to that, I taught a course in the humanities section called uh, Liberal Studies uh, 52, was the main thing, except it was 20th, yeah. century, 20th century humanities. Oh, okay. So those were okay. the two things that I yeah. was teaching. Okay. So somewhere along the line, you began to uh, use media and uh, got involved with managing that. Can you tell us a little bit about how that progressed? Right. In, in teaching uh, interdisciplinary courses, and there were sometimes as many as uh, oh, uh, 20 to, to up to close to 30 faculty members who would be uh, participating uh, in the, the curriculum, mm -hmm. and they were from all over the university, from every school in the university. And often because uh, they would be teaching uh, parts of the course that were out of their field or discipline, uh, of study, uh, we had to come together and meet every week as a faculty to determine what we're going to teach. Mm -hmm. But also, we needed some some help. And um, an example <coughs> is in the Nature of Man course. After it got started, one of the things that we were tackling uh, hard was uh, racial issues. And when Bill Cosby's course on Black History, Lost, Stolen, or Strayed, came along. Mm. Uh, we could actually use that. And it was one way in which you could bring information to the, to the class that would uh, uh, then allow for discussion. This was at, at a time when SMU and many universities were involved uh, in what I call process learning, process education. It's, you weren't just dumping information into their heads, but you were getting them to think and react and argue uh, and assimilate and reject and that kind of thing. Oh. So. Uh, using a film of that kind or a number of, uh, another thing that we used was a short film uh, called uh, Flatland, for instance, that was showing uh, diversity. And you, would, you, you could show a 15 minute film and then spend uh -huh, the rest of the class uh -huh. uh, talking about different kinds of issues. When we taught uh, in the humanities section, when we taught uh, about World War I, one of the most uh, dramatic things I think that, that was a part of the curriculum was showing a film called Over There, mm. which detailed trench warfare in World War I and how hundreds of thousands of soldiers died in the trenches as they just mm -hmm. went back and forth. And there were these, this was actual footage uh, in a documentary that was there. Made a great impact on the students. So we began to use things mm -hmm. that could communicate beyond lecture and beyond the textbook. and. Uh, there wasn't any other way to do it. Also, both courses, but particularly the humanities courses, uh, relied heavily on the use of art and music. So uh, it wasn't always possible to bring live music into the classroom. 
uh, and certainly wasn't possible to bring great works of art into the classroom that could be studied and shown and analyzed and discussed. Mm -hmm. So slides, film strips, tape recordings, uh, that kind of thing were, mm -hmm. were, were necessary. And uh, uh, it was something that I liked to do, enjoyed doing, did do, and Dean Zeiss, who was the dean of the University College at the time, encouraged me to, to uh, share that with other people on the faculty. I, I became a part of the curriculum committee, became a part of the book selection committee, which also meant media selection yeah. and uh, developing of the course. And so uh, wisely, we incorporated the use of media in the development of the course from the very beginning. And, and that's sort of what happened in yeah. the birthing process. So you were asked to take on the lead of purchasing materials at some point in there then? Well, we didn't have money to purchase materials, so we, we rented from the public library. We had to rent from the public ah. library because uh, University Park was not a part of the Dallas Public Library system, so uh, we had to pay a small rental fee, but uh, it wasn't much. But oh, our early days were mainly renting material, uh, buying a few slides, copying things out of books, uh -huh. probably illegally, but uh, we, we got by. Yeah, okay, okay. So at some point then, you were asked to take on a position formally, as in, as, as part-time, I understand? Yes, uh, after originally. a few years, uh, it became such a, 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 a task that uh, Dean Tyson and I agreed that I would continue to teach because that's an important part of what feeds the curriculum, mm -hmm. but I would also be given uh, some out-of-class time to, to work with what we, I think at that time, were calling media services. Uh, University College Media Services, and uh, then it became part half time and three quarter time, and and then full time, and I was still teaching half time, and uh, <laughs> so you were doing it all, right? So, okay. So uh, <laughs> now, where where was Media Services at that time physically? We were located in Dallas Hall, and when I first started teaching, uh, there wasn't an office, but we had some equipment stored under the stairway. We had a couple of film projectors and about four. Bolden sack reel to reel tape recorders and probably half a dozen overhead projectors. That was the equipment that we had. All so right. And, and eventually um, we remodeled Dallas Hall in 1970, I think it was. Right. And uh, when we remodeled Dallas Hall, we already were, gosh, that was pretty quick. We were, we were up and running uh, well enough that uh, the renovation of Dallas Hall reflected a lot of new technology in the classrooms and we had a an office on the third floor. Mm -hmm. So what was high technology in 1968, 1970? What was cutting edge technology at that time? Well, there were a couple of things. One of them didn't really relate to us, but I remember Dean, uh, Joe Harris, who was Dean of Humanities, uh, paid what I consider at the time an inordinate amount of money for a, a, an instant response system for the psychology department over in, oh. in Higher Hall, <laughs> where you ask a question and you could punch a button. It, it never worked, they never <laughs> used it, and you know, Five years later, it was dumped. Uh, but at least we were trying. Yeah. We were open. And in the remodeling of Dallas Hall, we thought we really had hot stuff by having a film chain in the uh, control room, and, and then we could show films in every classroom on the third floor, and all of the uh, liberal studies classes were held on the third floor. Oh. But that was difficult, too, because I mean everybody had to start the, the film at the same time and, and whatever. But the high technology, the highest technology was the uh, was the 16 millimeter film until the advent of uh, the video tape recorder, and it was reel to reel video tape, black and white, okay. before color. Yeah. And uh, so we began to use black and white reel to reel video tape some too. Okay, such a transition, right? So this was all yeah. pure analog world at that time, wasn't oh it? Oh my, right? yes. <laughs> no. This technology from the digital world was still a long way away. Didn't right? know nothing about no computers. No. <laughs> Yeah, was not there. Yeah, so you go back to the Dallas Hall. You mentioned that uh, we, it was a, the film chain, which is a film projector going through some a series of of mirrors, and then right. went out to uh, being uh, broadcast. Was broadcast to wired classrooms, and all the classrooms in Dallas Hall had uh, were wired with television sets. Is that right. right? And then they could watch the program on television sets, twenty five or thirty classrooms uh, yeah. simultaneously. Yeah. Is that right? Uh, we would announce that uh, we would start the film at 10 after the hour, give people time to get into class and get started. But if you weren't ready, it started anyway. And so it was a little difficult to manage. Mm -hmm. So um, after a while, we decided we would try something different. And uh, 
we would show the films in large auditoriums. We even use McFarland Auditorium uh, mm. often, uh, and show it uh, two times, sometimes three times a week, so that students could could have a chance to see it. You lose the immediacy of the in-class experience, but often the films took up the whole classroom anyway. Right. So uh, there was some complaint that you know that was getting in the way of classroom time, and it did. So we learned to do some of the major film experiences outside. Sort of like study time. Oh, okay, outside class. regular yeah. class time, had several showings in McFarland. Right. Okay, okay. Well, how did that? Uh, how did the faculty react? To how was their involvement with the use of media during those early days, especially? Did they have to be brought along, or did they react to it favorably right away? Were they excited about it? Uh, they were always uh, interested and uh, uh, found it to be a, a very useful tool in teaching. There, there had to be a lot of hand-holding. Mm -hmm. They wanted, uh, in the beginning, I had to give them long reviews of the, of the film we were going to show and what it was going to say and some suggested questions that they might use at the conclusion of the film that would integrate it into the, the text oh. we were studying okay. or uh, uh, the book uh, yeah. of the month or whatever it was. But uh, they were open to learning. We had weekly faculty meetings. We would talk about the things we had seen or were about to see. Uh, and a lot of informal uh, exchange took place in that faculty, we had a, uh, in media service, which was kind of like the central co control room, and people would come by and schedule things and talk with each other after class, and they said, I just had a great experience mm -hmm. showing uh, the film 16 in Webster Grove today. You've really got to show that, and here's what we did with it, and here's how it worked, and mm -hmm. that would rub off on other faculty. So they would teach themselves. Mm -hmm and motivate themselves, and it, it was highly motivating. It was driven a lot by the content of the media, though, it sounds like, rather than it the technology. Indeed. It yeah. was indeed, and uh, we worked hard to try to make the media um, uh, interface with the text that we were reading. <coughs> As the courses developed, there was also a weekly lecture that was given by the coordinator of the course. And so those things, the weekly lecture, the media uh, events, and, and then the classroom, discussion experiences mm -hmm. or assimilation experiences really helped form the courses, I think. Mm -hmm. what, um, so what kind of technology developed or how was the use and pattern of technology and instructional support changing then back into the early 70s or so? Mm. Oh, in the early 70s we began to move more and more into uh, video. We began to buy some films. Uh, we began to build a film, film library. Okay. Um, the, uh, the faculty was drawn from, as I said, from the disciplines all across the university, and so people in business began to say, hey, uh, this is really a good experience in teaching these liberal studies courses. Uh, I'd like to have a film to use in my business administration class. Or uh, people uh, in economics would say, I'd like to have a film that would support some things we're doing, or." And it, so it began to spread to other parts of the university, and mm -hmm. that's when it began to be more and more difficult to keep up with and to know whether we were really university college media services or university media services or, or how that mm -hmm. was going to play out. Yes. And it continued to grow. So you were still in Dallas Hall then at that time in the early 70s, mid seventy into the mid-70s, and working yes. out of this centralized right. uh, area? Uh, we moved into uh, Fondren Library. Uh, in the, in the, actually the mid-70s, I guess it was. Okay. Uh, and uh, um, partnered with the uh, education department in, in uh, some ways because uh, they were making a lot of use of technology at the time as well, and they had a, a library space over there. Louis Smith mm -hmm. was okay. uh, in charge of the uh, uh, part of the library that involved that. And that's so the juvenile collection, or was that what it was yeah, called at that time? Yeah, it was the juvenile collection, but it involved a lot of things, including media and slides and overhead transparencies. Uh, we had one of the first color Xerox machines that was just wonderful to play with. Uh, I don't know that it really ever did any good educationally, but it was, a, it was an interesting experience. <laughs> I remember experience. that, exactly right. <laughs> um, Okay, so the library was beginning to collect the media as well, and you were partnering with them uh, while, when you moved Not over. organizationally, but 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 actually, yes. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we were, uh, as I say, with the education department and the and the library, and we were in a more central location mm -hmm. that way. So it was uh, uh, more identified with the university, I guess mm -hmm. you'd say. When did you begin uh, 
the distribution or use of media and other technology in other buildings than uh, Dallas Hall? Well, two, th two things. When, when uh, we ran out of classroom space in Dallas Hall and had to begin teaching in Higher Hall and um, some in the library, as I recall there were actually were some teaching rooms in the library at one time, um, and in Umphrey Lee Center, uh, we saw that we needed to, well from the very earliest times, we saw that we needed to get equipment into the classrooms. And I think one of the things, Bill, that's most unique about what we've done here is to create uh, not a flawless, but an excellent classroom distribution system that meant when a faculty needed some kind of media, a film, a video, a slide, a film strip, a mm -hmm. tape, in a classroom, at a given hour on a given day that they could rest assured that it would be there. And when they were through with it, they could walk out of the room and somebody would come, students would come and get that and take it away and they didn't have to deal with it. Mm -hmm. uh, and they would set it up for them. Um, well, and so uh, I think that has developed over the years and uh, probably remains fairly unique among universities uh, across the country where there is this uh, substantial a centralized uh, service for classroom mm -hmm. uh, distribution where you can distribute the media into the classroom. Yeah. And you know, when you came along, you were an important part of making that, that function. So you know what I'm yeah. talking about. Yeah. Um, so you were doing the value added kind of approach many, many years ago. And so. Well, we didn't know what was added. We just thought it was something you had to do. Right. <laughs> uh, no other uh, way to do it. Yeah. So in Dallas Hall, you were doing that, certainly, but you had the a different kind of structure there, and I guess eventually you were doing. Yeah, we just right. pulled it out from under the staircase and moved it up up the hallway. You know, yeah. fact, fact, carried it upstairs. There weren't even any elevators uh, when we started out in Dallas Hall, mm. or any air conditioning either. So oh. that's before it when it was before it was remodeled, remodeled originally. Okay, right. so in '70 it became air conditioned. Yes. Okay. Um, how did you then begin begin to uh, uh, gain support from the various departments throughout the? The, the, the campus, you were, I understand you sometimes a department of psychology or business or anthropology would have a little bit of budget for equipment and media and right. somehow you, you began to absorb that uh, support somehow? Uh, throughout the development of, of media services, uh, it was always negotiate, negotiate, negotiate if you're mm -hmm. going to get anything done. and. Uh, as, as various, di uh, religion department is a good example, or the sociology department. Uh, each department had their own slide projectors and their own tape recorders and a few, a few things, uh, pieces of equipment that they, that they had been using. We weren't, mm -hmm. this wasn't the first time that anybody ever used any kind of media on campus. It was the first integrated, concentrated, and thoughtful approach to it. Um, and so they would say, well, we'd like for you to come bring a film over to our class. So we'd like for you to bring slide projector over. And we negotiated and said, okay, if you turn over all your equipment and your library of, of, of materials to us, then, uh, then we'll do it. But we don't want, you know, you do some, we do some kind of approach. Mm -hmm. And um, it wasn't an easy sell, but it happened. And so through the religion department, the sociology, the psychology department, the anthropology people, the uh, business school, the whole school of business bought into us at one time, okay. that kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. What kind of staff did you have then in those um, growing days of the early 70s? Staff? What staff? <laughs> <laughs> uh, the University College had a secretary, and I was the media uh, coordinator and eventually director, and then we had student help. Um, so you ran it with student help in the in right. use of a secretary? Right. Okay. What was the first time you had another, another full-time staff member then? Oh. When was the first time that we had a full-time staff member? I guess that's when, we, I guess, that was when we began to do some uh, production work. And by that I mean producing <laughs> slides and uh, um, eventually producing some videotapes. Okay. And they really were videotapes. It was real to real tape recording kinds of things. Um, so you began making copies of slides out of uh, textbooks that faculty would use in class right. and that was... A but the, the first real... Uh, no, th even that was part-time. I guess the first staff member was Bill Halley. Hmm. 
who who came in 1974 okay. uh, as assistant. And he was a director. media librarian, he right? Was a media librarian. And uh, then, I guess, you were the next one to come along. Well, if I remember, there were there were a couple of staff there. Well, Judy when was I came. Judy was there, but uh, Judy uh, Childs, yeah, she uh, was part who part was, time, who right. was kind of the uh, uh, cleric clerical person. But she was the extension of the secretary that Dean Zeiss had always oh, had there. So okay. she, you know, that evolved. So that evolved into. Uh, Judy Child's position, and Judy Child's evolved into the media librarian uh, eventually. So mm -hmm. th that was two positions. Bill was a third position. Yours was then a fourth position. And then we added a production person, which was, I think the first one we had was Scott. Yeah, I remember. Scott. Certainly. Scott. Scott and Rachel. <laughs> Scott was married to Rachel, uh, and got, so which gave us five people. But yeah. uh, anyway, it was... Yeah. Uh, it, it basically grew as as the needs developed, and we could <coughs> prove that we had the needs. Yeah, uh, the money, and it was always negotiation. Again, the money for the salary for Bill Howie to come as an assistant was uh, provided in large measure by the education department because they had to have a lot of media to uh, 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 qualify for accreditation by the state board. Oh, okay. and so that helped us get that going. Now, I, I, am I right to say that Bill was also responsible for the first? Catalog or of uh, automated catalog or uh, Bill and, and Judy, but uh, but primarily Bill. But Bill and Judy put together the, the and we did it by xeroxing uh, uh, little cards that we had of things and, and uh, putting it together in the catalog. And then eventually he worked with the library in uh, putting out a uh, computer generated. This was our first encounter with computers. Was to put together a computer-generated catalog of, of materials, which this would we had never had before. Okay, this would have been in the late, mid to late seventies. This was the late seventies, yes. Uh, late seventies, okay. Uh, maybe even the early eighties, but no, was, yeah, I'd say about nineteen seventy-nine, seventy-eight, seventy-nine. Was the library even computerized and kept cataloging at that time? Uh, Are they still all on card catalogs? No, card in catalogs? fact, I, I made an error. Uh, this was not done by the library at all. It was done by the computer science people. Oh. And I, and I'm blocking on the young man's name who was in computer science uh, right now. But no, I, I was wrong. Uh, this was just a, a, com a computer science thing where, and, where the, and, and they had access to the mainframe computer and they, that's where the com what computing uh, that was being conducted on campus at that time was being taken care of. Mm. So they helped us put together a computer-generated catalog mm -hmm. and uh, print out. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So this is way before the library got into computers. <laughs> <laughs> so you were well ahead of their time, yeah. in fact. Okay. Well, let's talk a little bit about ma program materials. Um, we've talked about starting off with films, obviously, and throwing in some slide tape programs. And uh, what were the developments of ma materials, instructional materials? Uh, over the course of your uh, your tenure here? Well, first of all, we looked for material that would support uh, the concepts uh, and provoke discussion and illustrate uh, ideas or information. And we didn't care what the format was. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the beginning, it was mostly 16 millimeter film and uh, film strip and uh, slides. And then, uh, the development of video uh, was first with black and white tape, then we had color tape, then we had three quarter inch cassette tapes, okay. and finally VHS tapes, uh, and at the end, uh, DVDs. So that, that progress on the visual material uh, mm -hmm. and uh, film and video uh, became far and away the most popular form of uh, media in, in the classroom. But uh, we used film strips, I think, didn't we? Even mm -hmm. up until a few years ago, right? Uh, yeah. And probably still, you probably still own some, uh, because there were some things. There was a film on the Industrial Revolution mm -hmm. that did what needed to be done, and we couldn't find it in any other form. And we used a film strip on the Industrial Revolution up until the '90s. I know. So yeah, amazing. Uh, if it works, it works. It right? works. Yeah. <laughs> so. I remember you telling me some stories about how you used to help faculty. Putting 
Oh, yeah. Material in the room. Just talk yeah. a little bit about some well, of those stories. Well, this goes back to classroom distribution. I was classroom distribution in the beginning. Uh, uh, I had a student helping me then, too, but we would, but I had one faculty who, who would use film strips, but only if I would bring it to the room, and he wanted me to stay there until they begin the thing, and it was, it was one of these, we, uh, we were actually using a record player, so, so that you had a record player soundtrack. and a film strip, uh, and, you, and you, you, uh, it would make a little beep, and you'd turn the film strip went with the beep. And, and he wanted me to wait there and put the, put the uh, arm on the record player on the record and make sure <laughs> that it was going right before I could leave the room. So uh, we had to do a lot of hand-holding, yeah. anyway. To, yeah. to, uh, you were pushing the envelope of technology at that right. time, weren't you, right? Uh, <laughs> no shades of computers at that time. Yeah. But, uh, I had forgotten about the queued audio programs that, uh, or queued programs that had the audio cue on them that yeah. allowed you to advance uh, yeah. slideshows and film strips. And we thought we'd gotten big time when it would uh, advance automatically, you know, except that uh, you, uh, if you weren't careful, it didn't synchronize right, and it was always the wrong, the wrong picture on the wrong <laughs> words. So maybe the uh, manual thing wasn't so bad yeah. after all. But the high t another step in technology was the automatic advance of the, pro the programs. The, the development of, of technology is interesting, and, and maybe this is a place I should, should say <coughs> that uh, uh, the changing format uh, presented us with, with a problem not only in uh, cost, because we had to keep upgrading the equipment to accommodate <laughs> mm -hmm. the new format, but a lot of excellent material uh, was lost because the formats changed, and, and the example of that that rather good film strip on the Industrial Revolution um, that was so popular was never in any other form, and so it's now gone. You know, it didn't mm -hmm. it didn't yeah, transport over sure. into something else. Uh, yeah. And uh, then, as we began to archive information, we we ended up having a lot of uh, things that from which the technology had become obsolete. And so I think we're even facing that today uh, as the technology changes, keeping uh, either transporting the formats to something else or mm -hmm. losing them. So yeah, it has been always a challenge. In and then you've got copyright problems. We could have <coughs> copied that film strip over to another format, but everybody was concerned about copyright, so we yeah. didn't do that. Well, that's a good point. I do recall that in some early days we did, in fact, make copies and not really clear on right. of the copyright guidelines. and, right. and uh, finally became aware of that and sensitive We've to it always later. leaned towards uh, educational fair use, and I think we were fair, and mm -hmm. I think we uh, uh, did win some for SMU, and I think we did not trample unmercifully on the copyright holders, but yeah. it, was, it, was a, it was always an uneasy union uh, there. In your uh, time here, the past 35 years, or whatever it's been here, what can you tell us, tell me about the, um, how technology has been integrated into the educational experience and what, what kinds of, how did faculty grow in this, uh, in this area, the use of technology? Well, as you know, uh, college and university faculty members uh, mostly do not have any kind of educational experience. They're never taught how to teach. They're taught what they know. The content, and, and right, and right. They're, they're given the information yes. and they're just supposed to somehow magically know how to teach. Right. And, the way they, and the way they learned how to teach was from their professors, and their professors taught them what a good role model was, what a good professor was, mm -hmm. what a good teacher was. Unfortunately, their professors did not have technology. And so uh, when the use of technology came along, most faculty didn't know what to do with it. And it was a new learning experience. And so in, in a part, we were engaged in teacher education. At the, mm -hmm. at, the, at the university level. And that's always a hard one to win. Yeah. Um, but because the faculty members could see uh, the benefit in using technology, they were usually willing to learn. It just took time and money and effort, and it meant that we were always behind. Uh, the public schools were way out ahead, uh, and to some extent still are, but not as much as they were 10 years ago of the college faculty in, in knowing how to teach. And I suspect that college faculty today are mentoring the teachers of tomorrow so that we're not going to have that kind of experience. Uh, people, faculty will come into their teaching as university teachers mm -hmm. fully aware and conversant with the use uh, and potential for technology in teaching. But we were, yeah. we were in that difficult transitionary period there when the faculty had no concept, no clue, 
and initially no interest in using anything other than their voice at the chalk and the blackboard to yeah, teach with. So. Right. So in the early days at least, and well throughout your career I guess, you were actually um, proposing and working toward that um, the, the pr uh, true definition of instructional technology in its fullest sense. Right. The technology with instruction and, and integrating those two. And so as you said, you were involved I, with teacher education from yeah. early days. I, I think what helped make this work as well as it has at SMU, and I hope it has worked well, um, is the fact that I actually approached it from the teaching point of view uh, as a faculty member in the earlier days. And uh, also a, as, a, as a humanist, I am a humanist. I am not mm -hmm. a technological person. Uh, yeah. I have a degree in theology and American literature. Uh, so, you know, using the, the technology was not just because, hey, here's a new whiz bang, let's do it, you yeah. know. Uh, yeah. But uh, does this really make sense and how can I use it and why would I want to and that kind of thing. Yeah, okay. Well, let's speak to that issue of uh, uh, your belief, and I agree that you're a humanist. Why did that affect the organization of media services and what it was? How did that? How did that, your own style and your own philosophy, translate into the way media was supported on the campus? Well, starting with the staff, I never, I never, uh, I never chose a staff person for their technical abilities alone. Uh, my first criteria was, you know, can they relate to people? Uh, can they work as a team? Are they open-minded? Can they, can they embrace mm -hmm. new ideas and, and grow and learn? And um, so uh, I was fortunate to have many staff people on our team. Well, how long have you been here? 20, 26 years? 23 years. 23, 23 years. years. Right, right. I'm just, I'm pretty young. Yeah. Right. Uh, <laughs> Judy Toth was here for uh, 20 plus years. That's right. Uh, Bill High was here for over 10 years. Uh, so anyway, that, that the other was uh, uh, in working with the faculty, um, I think I could talk to them in terms that uh, could help them see the value in, in, in using uh, mm -hmm. a different medium other than uh, lecture and uh, printed materials. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Well, as I reflect back on those days and think about the growth of media and as a department and as a support unit and the use of technology and instruction, I, I, I'm convinced that it was, in fact, that kind of approach that helped. Uh, because you were never focusing on the technology as much as you mm -hmm. were on the content and mm -hmm. helping technology to do a better job of helping faculty teach better. You know, seems like that was always the driving force in your philosophy. And that's the reason that, that the format was never the primary issue. It yeah. was, you know, is there something out there that will help us get this idea across? Yeah. And what is it? And then, yeah. and then how do we do it? So you were actually, we were involved uh, with uh, acquisitions, uh, uh, purchasing programs for many, many years, I know, for uh, from the very beginning, certainly, and then into later on in your, your tenure here, and you always uh, right. did that. Right. We, uh, we bought, uh, uh, every year for 10 years or so, I w went to the American Film Festival, and we used to have to preview every film that we bought, and a film at that time, this was in the 70s, would cost an average of three to $500 for one film. And we had an annual budget of about two thousand dollars, so you know we had to be very careful what we spent <laughs> our what we spent our money on, and then we rented the rest. And uh, I think in all we probably collected around five hundred films in our film library. Mm -hmm. You probably know better than I do now. Uh, and now then, I think we have uh, well over three thousand videotapes. So, so you see, the I mean, you can buy a videotape today for twenty dollars. Yeah, right. Forty dollars. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, the, the development of the, of the teaching materials, there was a time we went through where slides were the most important thing in the world for a faculty. I don't know if it was an art faculty or the economics faculty or the business faculty, they wanted slides. And so we reproduced slides at about five billion a day, <laughs> you know. And, uh, well, I do remember, literally, I think you, used, you gave this figure at one point that we were making upwards of 20, 25,000 slides per year quite easily. And uh, from books that faculty used in class, so right? That, yeah. That's it was really a way to illustrate materials. It it took over what the old overhead projector had done, but it did it in spades. And, and faculty learned to love to use slides, and they 
And it was a way of personalizing. The, uh, another interesting, as we talk, uh, development in the use of media, in the beginning, we had a film. Everybody saw that film. It was so expensive or it was so rare that everybody used it. Uh, now then, every, every faculty member uh, individualizes their own use of media. Don't mm, you think? I, yeah, it's rarely right, right. that the same film is shown to more than two or three classes on the campus uh, in a course. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, and so uh, this was what was happening with the faculty in the use of slides. They, they were able to uh, in begin to individualize their own uh, teaching material, and they loved it. And yeah. so that's that. And the same thing has taken place, is, is now taking place with computers. It's probably the single most uh, gift to the to the faculty person who wants to bring individual material and resources mm -hmm. to his teaching, mm -hmm. uh, all the way from accessing sites on the internet to displaying material in the classroom. So yeah. I think that's the reason it has become such a favored uh, technology. Yeah. Uh, today. I hadn't thought of that until we were, you were saying that, but it's like the broadcast mask media of, of the early days of television when you had three channels or four channels to choose from. Everybody saw the same programs. Same program. and it wasn't until cable came along, probably, that we began to be right. uh, this, this inundated by a number of And I was choices. thinking just the other day that I think that's going to continue to move in the direction to where you no longer have what we have now, you know, major channels. But everybody, much the way they surf the, the Internet, is going out and getting their entertainment and their media by choice. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, this is kind of like the old... Buck Rogers phenomenon where the, you, the prediction becomes the future. But I can remember 10 years ago, or less than 10 years ago perhaps, when uh, the pr prediction was being made that you could have video on demand. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, it was so uh, out of the realm of possibility that most people couldn't even, wouldn't even entertain the idea. Uh, I bought into it at least as an idea, but we we kept we kept in search of Carolyn Casina and people in the library and some uh, Maureen Festine eventually were really interested in trying to develop this kind of thing, and it still hasn't happened uh, to perfection. But the technology now exists where that can actually mm -hmm, take place. Mm -hmm. So you know, if we wanted to pay the the bucks and 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 subscribe to it, you could have video on demand in the classroom. Yeah, yeah. essentially. So right, it right. has come to yeah. this. And certainly, the internet is is where that will seems to be going in the, for the future with streaming media or streaming video and so yeah I think that's a good point. Let's uh, change directions a little bit and now we've talked about the, uh, the history in terms of where you began and so forth but let's th do a little bit of organizational uh, look at uh, where media services was or it reported to and changed over the course of your 25 plus years as, uh, in the media. Start off in University College, as you said before. Right. Well, and as I said, the uh, uh, Dean George Zeiss was head of University College when I began, and uh, the 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 thing I will always be grateful to Dean Zeiss for is that he was open to anything, and he would support any idea, no matter how ridiculous or radical it was, if you. I had a convincing argument that mm -hmm. it, ought, it ought to be tried. And uh, so uh, we were able to develop some things. And the other thing is that uh, he would never make a decision, but if you would decide and do something and tell him this is what you're going to do, he'd say, okay. <laughs> uh, and so we begin to get some things done that way. After uh, uh, a while, and it became clear that we needed to become a university-wide uh, facility support system beyond the bounds of the university college. Um, the university, quite frankly, never did really know what to do with us. And so for a while we were under the provost office, uh, and then for a while we were uh, under the associate provost office, and then we uh, finally wound up uh, related to the library, partly by negotiation and partly by choice. Uh, when Maureen Pastine came to be director of the libraries in, uh, when was that? Mm -hmm. Mid to late 80s? The, the late, no, the early 90s. About 19, about. 1990 yeah, is what I had, I think you told me at some point that it was, was the time we became part uh, of CUL. 
then libraries. we were invited to consider becoming a part of the library system. And, and I accepted. Bill, the, uh, we're talking about how getting faculty to uh, buy into and, and to use and to uh, be open to and to accept media in teaching. Mm -hmm. And that was difficult. But it was nowhere near as difficult as getting the administration to uh, understand what uh, was going on across the country and other universities with media and what the potential would be for the university here and ultimately what the faculty really wanted the administration to do. Uh, and I don't fault the administration as being um, intentionally uh, reticent in, in the area. Uh, once again, they, they were people who were the top of their fields and, and who mm -hmm. were mentored a, 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 as faculty, by faculty who had no concept of this right. kind of teaching, many of them of whom had been out of teaching for a while and so weren't involved. And it was just a difficult sell, and always was. Uh, I, I chafed at it for a while in that even when we were under the office of the provost, that when I would have my meetings with the provost or the associate provost, depending on who I was reporting to, uh, yes, yes, we think that's a good idea, you go do it. You know, don't uh, bother me. You don't bother do me it. anymore. You just, you go do it, uh, <laughs> and uh, so that's what I meant by negotiation. A lot of it was negotiating with people, negotiating for budget, negotiating for coalitions, and as I look back on it, that's not necessarily a bad way to have done. Mm -hmm. It was a difficult way. Yeah. A very difficult way. Yeah. Uh, and I think we would have been ahead in some ways had uh, had the administration been more daring, more open, uh, more vital. But uh, ain't bad. Yeah. Well, it certainly has changed in the last five, seven years. Yeah. And toward the end of your tenure here, I know, in the last few years, as we've gotten into the digital age of the yes. uh, technology. So was uh, that was that a well? Made see, a difference? the administrators use computers. <laughs> so, so it's yeah. easy. It's easy to buy into that. And, and every uh, faculty has a computer on their desktop. Certainly, over the last five years or so, and, at least, and, and uh, more. So, so we're growing up together. Well, we all grew up together with the same, uh, w w the playing field was leveled with computers, but mm -hmm. before that it, it was not. So uh, those early days of when you were in the analog world, it was a different world. Uh, by the way, I need, to, uh, I, I need to, to share the story about the development of computers. The, uh, the math department had some old computers <laughs> that, Texas Instrument computers that they didn't want, and they were about to discard, and we said, oh, we'll take them and build a computer lab. Well, we got them and scratched our heads over it because they didn't do anything. I mean, we didn't have any, uh, the, the software didn't, didn't exist to continue. It was a different platform. I forget what it was called, but it didn't, it didn't work well. So we traded them off for some uh, simple DOS 286 machines, and uh, the rest is history. You know, they, they kept upgrading and upgrading and upgrading and developing from computer labs. We were the first computer lab on campus, and uh, then, uh, when we did some remodeling, we greatly expanded the computer labs, and for uh, several years until it just got too big of a headache, we were the computer lab on campus, mm -hmm. which now is, is, is housed in Bradfield. Yeah, uh, and other places as well. Right. Uh, if I remember those early days of our computer facility, was a was a lot of time devoted toward uh, classroom use, rhetoric, if I'm not mistaken. Right, we would bring in whole classes that. to come in and use the computers and, and, and do things on them. Uh, but then in the evenings, they would be used for completing class assignments yeah. and that kind of thing. That was shared. And once again, you know, staffing was critical and when we took advantage of students and an enterprising student who is still a, a student and sometime worker, Bob Monahan, remember Bob? Yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah, yeah. Sort of helped us uh, keep things together mm -hmm. in, in, in the labs in ways that would uh, normally not have been possible. Yeah. But, uh, so this would have been about what time? This is in the, um, toward the end of the 80s, I guess, and you took yes, on these uh, computers? Right. I think in 1978 is when we first or 80, 80, 88. 88. 88, yeah. 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 And the library we became part of Central University Libraries, 1880. Well, uh, yeah, let me go back to that. Uh, or 90. When, when we decided to, after the administration, when we finally decided to join forces with the library, and then I reported to Maureen Pastine. Mm -hmm. um, those were probably the years of the best development administratively that we've had. Uh, we, we had a good relationship with Maureen and with the library, and at first the library staff was very, very suspicious of having uh, 
this non-print media in their midst over there and mm -hmm. having to deal with it. But uh, over the years, uh, it has become quite integrated in everything from cataloging to uh, circulation to uh, online catalogs to everything mm -hmm. has been integrated in a, in a wonderful way. And it's being, it's, I think media is now being treated uh, as any other form of uh, primary information uh, by the university. But uh, Maureen was a, uh, was, was a wonderful, and I, and I left uh, shortly after she did, so I haven't had the experience of the new librarian, uh, Jillian, mm -hmm. but I understand that the library continues to be yeah, a, yeah. A, 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 a very positive force in the development of uh, what's going on. Yeah, very much so. You mentioned uh, Maureen Pasteen, of course, during your time here. Who were some of the people uh, throughout your tenure that were key in making or helping you move things along in terms of uh, instructional support? Anyone else come to mind? Well, Dean Zeiss and, and Maureen were, on, it's interesting, on either end of my tenure here, were, right, were the right. most influential. Uh, but we've always had uh, uh, faculty who have been supportive and deans who have been supportive. Uh, I'm afraid to start picking out any, any particular uh, ones, actually, for yeah. fear I would, on the spur of the moment, uh, leave the most important <laughs> one out. Uh, but yeah, yeah we've, sure. we, we have certainly had uh, uh, people at that level who, who have, uh, have encouraged us, uh, not only with uh, their uh, verbal support, but sometimes with uh, money and other kinds of support. Uh, Dedman College particularly has, uh, the, the, the new interim of uni uni uh, the university college right. has been very supportive and, and even financially in giving us, and the right. business school. Yeah, so. that's a good point. We've always been, by default, linked toward Dedman College, University College, and then Dedman College, of mm -hmm. course, as we supported the core courses and those introductory courses that came along here, and it still seems to be that way today. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Other departments and schools have done their own, grown their own departments, seems like, over the years, more or less. And, yeah. uh, tell me a little bit about other developments in terms of media support over the years. Uh, uh, other things besides, of course, the media library and classroom, uh, where those have always been two key components, but what are the other developments? Can you recall, you mentioned labs, but other things that may have come up over the years that were significant um, changes and growth in the technology support? I, I'm not sure what you're asking me, but, but in terms of significant changes in, in things, the, uh, the only thing that you haven't mentioned, I don't believe, is, is the development of computers yeah. and computers in, uh, in the teaching experience. And uh, we're still in the middle of that. I'm not sure yeah, where that's going certainly. to right, uh, right. play out. Well, let me, uh, we, uh, the department changed the names. Uh, at, oh, yes. the, at the time we became CMIT was because of, uh, of uh, some money that came in to right. create the center. Tell a little bit about, about that. Through, through uh, largely through uh, the encouragement of Maureen, uh, I wrote several grants and one of them, uh, proposals, and one of them was for uh, establishing the the Center for Media and Instructional Technology, which was funded by uh, Emily Norwick uh, in uh, just out of Austin, Texas. Right. And uh, uh, we also uh, wrote a grant to the uh, Culpeper Foundation for, uh, uh, to, to help teachers uh, integrate uh, media into the classroom experience, and, and that was uh, very successful. And. Uh, we were able to get some money from uh, several other private foundations and groups through Kerr the Kerr Foundation, I believe, was the Kerr was Foundation. One. Was the Kerr one. Foundation was a was a significant yeah. one. Uh, President Pi was influential in getting money for us from the Hoblet Cell Foundation. So, during mm -hmm. that last ten years, I was there, and, and Maureen was there. And we were working together. Yeah. We, we we came into money we had never had before, yeah. uh, and administrative support I had never had before. Right, right. That was a good, some good days. Right, right. Well, any other uh, any other thoughts that you can uh, uh, recall about significant events that uh, uh, changed the course of the use of technology in the 
and instruction uh, while you were uh, uh, in your tenure? No, I, uh, the technology, at least at SMU, and the use of technology at SMU has always been driven by the need of the faculty. Mm -hmm. And uh, it has changed because uh, the faculty has either perceived that it was no longer useful, not everything that we did was a success, uh, or it has changed because faculty found uh, another way to do something on their own. And so uh, faculty have often gone off on their own and, and done things that uh, were often brilliant, sometimes frustrating, but you know, uh, in, in which they could do uh, their own thing. Yeah. And um, yeah, well, we were um, in those days in the 80s, as you were talking about computers becoming a more common in use. We were uh, in the uh, forefront of doing that, and uh, uh, during those grant-making uh, uh, days, we the creation of the digital commons was a key, uh, a key legacy of yours, in fact. Uh, when we were actually creating one of the things that yes that I was most pleased about was creating the, the digital commons which uh, uh, still exists but in a different form uh, which was a way of being innovative and creative and create uh, helping create uh, digital material for uh, instructional use and purposes and I think under the leadership of Bob Skinner that's still going forward and they're still uh, getting grant money and uh, the uh, Teaching and learning. Teaching, uh, uh, Center for Teaching Excellence. Uh, yeah. Center for Teaching Excellence uh, yeah. was established uh, that, that helps to uh, oversee some of that. Yeah. Uh, right. how, how was it getting yeah. faculty to buy into the use of, of instructional technology in that, uh, that realm during those days after the Culpepper grants and so forth. What, what kind of things were you the doing to of, get uh, uh, computer, getting, yeah, uh, computer uh, di instructional technology in that re uh, regard? You had the Culpepper. That was that was a catalyst to get faculty involved in creating programs right. to change the way they taught. If I'm not mistaken, right. Um, that was that was difficult only to the extent that uh, um, we we did not have in the beginning of this time uh, enough uh, support on uh, technical uh, equipment and technical support on campus. Right. Uh, I understand that's changing now uh, and that there are uh, computer connection, high-speed computer connections almost everywhere and yeah. uh, display uh, projectors, computer projectors right, and that right. kind of thing that, that, mm -hmm. were, that were missing. So it was a little, little slow uh, in getting started uh, but again, we were we were right up there at the beginning. So I think uh, uh, I think we're going to see the f uh, the fruits of that endeavor uh, yeah. continue to unfold. Yeah, it seems to me that that uh, that through your leadership and that at that time that was uh, of course there are many people involved in that and that, that worked together. But you were instrumental in moving that along in terms of instructional technology, computer-based instructional technology right. support. Uh, uh, through those grants. And, and once again, I think the contribution that we have made uh, has, has been largely felt in the area of uh, the humanities and sciences mm -hmm. uh, because uh, the engineering folks have always been way out there in technology and technological development. Um, and uh, so with the humanities and sciences, but also with the uh, uh, theology school and the law school, I think we've, we've had been able to offer some support the business school, particularly in the last decade, uh, have pretty well been uh, self-contained and, mm -hmm. and uh, approaching things from their own perspective and doing a, a good job of that. So. Yeah. yeah. Well, as we uh, begin to uh, come toward the end of our time here, are there uh, any other uh, things you like to reflect on for a bit as we... Uh, well, only to, to make sure that... Uh, it's understood that everything that has happened in the development of, uh, of the use of media on campus uh, was a team effort. And I really uh, am eternally grateful for the kind of staff support that we've always had. 
and the collegiality of the staff and the working together. It's like a family, you know, of people working together and multitasking and covering for yeah. one another and uh, uh, the kind of uh, uh, development that comes from there. And that, I think, has been key to what I hope was a, a successful development. Well, no, I think I would tend to agree wholeheartedly with you. I, I remember hearing you once at a presentation where you uh, spoke uh, to some, I guess, to some national organization that about an uh, organization, the media departments and so forth, and you referred to the directors as a conductor, mm -hmm. and that you had uh, these various instruments out there that uh, people played their parts, and, right. and your role was to just make sure they had they harmonized. <laughs> and I thought that was always a good analogy. Work together. Yeah, just to work together, right. Well, thank you for your time today, Travis. It's been a lot of fun. It's so, a pleasure, uh, all right, thank you.